Hey everyone, back again. Let's continue on the Marx train here with now episode two, starting from part two, and this is going to cover the entirety of part two. Now, before jumping into it, uh, if you want to follow me in here, you can find me on Instagram at the year underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guineo. Just trying to speed through this. If you want to help me out, like, share, subscribe, you know all the things to do. Uh, you should go check out part one if you've already, if you're starting here, that'd be weird. Go listen to part one. Uh, and yeah, you know, let's jump into this starting with part two here. The transformation of profit into average profit. Actually, we're just going to cover part two. So starting with chapter eight, different compositions of capital in different branches of production and the resulting variation in rates of profit. So here by composition, he's referring to whether uh, an industry, a factory has more spent on constant capital versus variable capital or the other way around. So composition is referring to that relationship between amount spent on constant capital versus that amount spent on variable capital. So here Marx undertakes an analysis of changes in the profit rate if wages, surplus value in the working day remain constant. Now he's gonna do this to try to find out what the average profit rate is and its relationship to all of these other components, uh, surplus value, uh, the intensity of the working day, profit, wages, and so on. Now it's important to note that the average profit of the individual capitalist is not determined by the surplus labor of a, of a single capitalist. It's going to be determined by the total social capital as a whole. So the total social value, total profit across the total economy. And different enterprises are going to work to maintain this average. So you're going to get banks that set up like interest rates, which we're going to talk about a lot as we go on. Uh, interest rates that is a derivative of profit. Uh, you're going to set up like other, you know, if you are to receive some kind of an investment, you're probably going to have to tell people what profit you seek to make. And they're going to compare that to the profit that they anticipate you'll make based off of the economy at that time. So to think about profit rate, he says that in a given industry, that there are two uh, composition, compositional proportions in an industry. There is the technical composition that refer, refers to the proportion of labor to the means of production and raw materials, so that relationship. And then there's organic competition, which refers to the relationship of produced value to the means of production and raw materials. Now, the organic composition could also refer to uh, the relationship of values of C spent on constant capital to what is spent on V, not just their magnitude. So thinking about their rates and, and their relationship. So I say these terms, these different compositions, but it is by no means clear exactly what they refer to, and there is some degree of overlap. With that being said, I think that we can think about technical composition as referring more specifically, as, I, as I've said here, to the proportion of labor in relation to the means of production and raw materials, uh, whereas organic composition is going to refer to the relationships of the actual produced value to the means of production and raw materials. At least this is what he offers us. And if anyone says that the, that the distinction between the two is super clear and super easy, then uh, offer them this. That if it is that the final value and its relationship to the relations of uh, rela the, produ the modes of production, sorry, the means of production is what constitutes organic composition Whereas in technical composition, it is the proportion of labor in relation to the means of production. If labor and value go hand in hand, how are we really talking about anything, uh, two different things here? And it isn't like a totally consequential part of this whole book. Uh, he just offers this us this distinction. And I'd be really curious if anyone had a very strong grasp of the distinction, how they would put it in their own words to make it as clear as possible. I'd be very curious to see how anyone else did it. Um, in such a way that I wouldn't be able to poke holes in it. Because as I was reading Marx, it did feel like a little bit of an underdeveloped idea with quite a few issues if we take Marx, uh, if we read Marx against himself. But anyways, I don't want to belabor the point. If, for example, to continue on here, if we had two industries with a total capital of $700, let's say, depending on their distribution of constant capital versus variable capital, they will yield different rates of profit 
which makes sense. I mean, if more is spent on variable capital and more is taken out in terms of surplus value, it's going to yield more profit. Whereas if a ton is spent on constant capital, you might not be able to extract more surplus value from that. Uh, or in addition to that, because there is no relationship between exploitation and machines. And so therefore, you might not be able to yield a whole lot of profit. So if one allocates $600 to constant capital of this $700 total, 600 to constant capital, and therefore $100 to variable capital or wages, the profit will be $100. Let's, let's just say the profit is $100 because we're dealing with a surplus value rate of 100%. And if $100 is spent on wages, 100% surplus value rate is going to give you $100 in profit and surplus value. So the profit rate is equal to 100 over 700, the total cost, whereas the surplus value, which is 14%, whereas the surplus value rate is, as we've already said, 100%, because that's 100 over 100. 100 spent on wages, 100 earned in profit or surplus value. Now, if we had another industry that instead of spending $600 on constant capital, instead, instead spent $100 on constant capital, and 600 on variable capital, we'd get a very different situation. What we would get would be a profit rate of 600 in relation to 700, because the profit rate is staying the same. $600 spent on wages means that $600 is going to be earned in surplus value if the profit rate is 100%, if the surplus value rate, sorry, is 100%, which means that your profit rate instead of being 14% as it was in the under, other industry, is now going to be 85% because we're looking at 600 in relation to the total social, uh, the total cost, which is 600 over 700, which is 85% profit rate. So it's just important to note here how the different compositions of capital, either with more spent on constant capital versus variable capital or vice versa, will yield different results in terms of the profit rate and surplus value rate uh, if we aren't taking these th that to be constant. And that puts us here into chapter 9, the formation of a general rate of profit, or an average rate of profit, and the transformation of commodity values into prices of production. So in order to find the average, quite simply, we can just compile all of the different capitals the money that's spent on C plus V plus S, or, or that, that is earned, sorry, so the organic composition here, because we're talking about the value earned and its relationship to the rest of the uh, what is spent. So if we take all of the capital across all industries, their C, their V, their S, uh, various industries are from many parts of a single industry, and then divide it by their to the total number of industries we had, uh, you know, in order to find the average, because that's what you do, You'd, you'd get the average rate of profit. Now, this average profit is going to be, might be that thing called the natural price or the natural rate of profit. And so if any new industry wants to emerge, it has to keep itself around that same rate of profit or else it's going to risk uh, overselling or underselling and then either not being competitive or, or just being not being competitive. Because if it sells for too, for too much, no one's going to buy their stuff. And if they sell for too less, they aren't going to earn enough money to actually keep up with the competition. And we can do this across an entire nation or even the world, uh, hypothetically. That is, if we took the sum of the profit rate of each produced product and divided it by the number of, of products, of commodities. So if we took that surplus value that is earned on every single product or, or its profit rate and divide it by the number of things sold of all those things we've tallied, then we get the kind of average profit rate. However, this formula doesn't account for differences in sizes of industries. So for example, a local flower shop might have a profit rate of 100%, uh, whereas an, like a national car manufacturer might have a profit rate of 10% or 20%. So it's important to account for the different ways or the, the magnitude of the industry in actually coming at this conclusion or discovering this average rate of profit. So to do this, in order to actually come to a national average rate of profit or a global average rate of profit, whatever our, our, our terrain is, our location, whatever our specific territory we're dealing with, we must then weigh each individual profit rate of any given industry in accordance with the size of that capital of that industry, 
So whether or not it's a big industry or like a local flower shop. And we must compare that to or see how much of it uh, corresponds to the total social capital. So that uh, in that industry, with that car manufacturing industry, that 20% profit rate is going to weigh a whole lot more than the 100% profit rate of a flower shop. And these are just totally arbitrary numbers. Who knows? Like just insert whatever here. The point is that with different size industries is going to have a different effect on this discovering or calculating this average rate of profit. So if we worked through these calculations, we might find that on average, the profit rate is 20%, just hypothetically, let's say across the board, 20%, where C, uh, the constant capital, makes up 80% of a given total capital of all industries, and variable capital is 20% of all of those industries. So on average, we've figured out hypothetically what the profit rate is and the composition of capital in each of those, uh, kind of across the board, sorry, of those industries, where we found that 80% uh, across the board is spent on constant capital, machines, raw materials, etc., and 20% is spent on labor. So in this arrangement, what we see, or the C plus V plus S equation we have here, is we have 80, 80% plus 20 plus 20 surplus value, assuming a surplus value rate of 100%. So that means that in order to find the profit rate, which we already agreed upon is 20%, again, only hypothetically, that 20 surplus value is related to the total social product or the total cost, 80 plus 20, so 20 over 100, 20%. And the surplus value rate is 100% because it's 20 surplus value related to 20 spent on wages. So 100%. Now, if we had an industry that had a higher composition or higher rate of C to V, where there was instead of 80 spent on constant capital, there was 90 spent instead and 10%, 10 spent on variable capital, what we would find is that it has a higher composition, or Marx says that this, this company would have a higher composition, whereas a lower composition would be a company in which only 70, hypothetically, or less than the average is spent on constant capital versus variable capital. So in an industry that corresponds to the average composition, what we've agreed here after we've done our averages, again, totally hypothetical, 80-20, 80 on constant, 80 on wages on variable capital. If an industry does that, what that means is that the price of their product is going to be equal to the value put into the product. Whereas if we had a higher composition, what that would mean is where more is spent on constant capital versus variable capital, what that would mean was that we would actually have a lower value among all of the products made and a higher price or than the price. And this is because there is less labor going into those products, which means that there's less value being transmitted to those products. Whereas if there was more spent on wages, in a lower composition where there's less spent on uh, constant capital, more spent on wages, we would see a higher value and probably a lower price. But this only works if we are assuming that all products across the board, across all industries are all sold at the same price, and we are just comparing their differing, um, the different compositions of the companies, of the factories, of the industries that make them which isn't realistic. Marx, Marx isn't saying this is like a true formula of the way things work. He's just helping us understand through these hypotheticals how things do work. So he's, he's really showing us the abstract in order to help us understand the concrete. And the concrete here is to understand how differing compositions, how more spent on constant versus spent on wages, will affect the transference of value to products and how these, these effects will ensue in relationship to uh, an average, an average rate of profit. So you remember when we started the book in the last episode, we talked about cost price, where Marx crunched the formula down to C plus, from C plus V plus S to cost price plus S, so the price of all this stuff. Now he says that because we know what the average profit is, we know what capitalists can aim for in terms of surplus value, in terms of their profit, in order to remain competitive. 
so as not to oversell, overcharge, or undercharge for their products. So average rate of profit then just presents a kind of equilibrium point where varying industries' profit rates cancel each other out, where they attain this uh, equilibrium, this coordination of supply and demand, we could, we could say. Now that puts us here into chapter 10, the equalization of the general rate of profit through competition. Market prices and market values surplus profit. So the same applies here to the cost of production, that is capital, uh, that can be averaged according to all capitalist expenditure. So we just look at all the different capitalists, what are they spending on production, and then we divide by the number of capitalists, and we'll get this, we'll get this value. So too low or too high capital spent could mean losses. You spend too much, you won't be competitive because you know you have to overcharge to make up for those high costs, you aren't going to be able to sell as much. Or if you under underspend on production, you might not make as many products and you might not be able to make as much as your competitors. So competition aids in this process in order to, in his words, that is competition distributes the social capital between the various spheres of production in such a way that the prices of production in each of these spheres are formed after the model of the prices of production in the spheres of mean composition. So competition makes it so that we can attain this social average, the social average profit, social average of what, of what is spent in production, average of exploitation of labor, and so on. But how do we actually arrive at an average profit? How, how does this happen? And this is a bit of a mystery that runs throughout the course of this book from here to the very end. Uh, he'll, he'll leave from this question for a while, and then at the end, he'll bring it, bring it back in and really meditate on this a little more. So it seems as though the average price and average costs uh, are determined by exchange. Exchange is going to determine you know, what things can go for on the market. And it would seem as though uh, they do not cause the prices of things. That is, the average price doesn't say what the price is or what things will go for in exchange. It seems like exchange is what will determine the average price. Yet the average price dictates how much things are going to be sold for. That is, a capitalist wants to hit this average price in order to remain competitive. And the difficulty here lies is that we're confronted with this chicken and egg situation. Does the average price come before the actual act of exchange on, on the market? Or does exchange determine the average price? And average price really serves as, you know, developed with the gradual trade would kind of be the easy answer. People began to trade more and more, assuming, and we're barring off questions here about the intervention of states in regulating prices. Let's imagine this, this Adam Smith utopia of people just exchanging things and earning money as a result, selling commodities without any kind of intervention. So we need upon, or sorry, we need an agreed upon baseline to allow trade to occur in the market, because otherwise we wouldn't have any kind of common ground to have trade happen. So like with what Ricardo says about rent, and we're going to talk about this a lot more <laughs> later on, price is determined by the most difficult, uh, di difficulty laden enterprises if there is high demand because there is a more strain of even worse off producers. So what that means is that the price of a good is going to be determined by the most, uh, the least efficient industry that must be working to meet the demand. So if there is demand for corn and there is so much demand that you need to start working on fields that suck uh, in order to just make a little bit more to meet that demand, the price has to be set by those worst fields or else if they were set by the best fields, they could be set really low. The price of corn could be set really low. And that would mean then that you aren't going to be able to properly compensate people working on those worst lands. So then there will be no way to actually incentivize people to work on those worst lands, and you will therefore not meet the demand, uh, people will die, and the whole system will, will kind of crumble. So prices need to be set by the worst lands. And this sets this baseline and sets the possibility for this average rate of profit. And this isn't Marx. Marx isn't saying this. This comes from Ricardo. And Marx is going to poke holes in this later on. 
So d- this isn't just uh, just Marx saying this here. This is comes from the other political economists as well. So conversely, if there is an ample supply, let's say there's a ton of corn, the market price will still reflect situation of the least uh, of the least strained enterprise. So in that case, if there's a ton of corn, then the better worked land is going to be able to set the prices of things because they can compete with other really good land because all the good land is the only land being worked. There's ample supply. You know, you don't got to go work on crappy land that needs to be accommodated in order to keep the system afloat. Now, this part you don't really see in Ricardo. Ricardo doesn't consider situations in which there is ample supply and in which case the best lands will determine the price of corn. So, but that we're going to talk about that much later on. Now, the point here, there, there are two general properties to kind of take from this, that the law of value determines why, um, why an increase or a de- decrease of labor will result in a change of prices and the amount of labor required. Like if it's a worse land and there needs to be more labor, you have to be able to meet the price of that labor, the cost. And the second property is that the average profit must be tethered to the rate of surplus value that accrues to a given capital as an aliquot part or, a, or as a part of the total social capital. Now, as an aside, he considers what it would mean if the workers earned or, or owned, sorry, owned the means of production. So objects that they made would be sold for what went into them. So the workers would make 100% of the things and they would own 100% of those things and earn 100% of what was made off of them. Now, the thing here, and there's only like a paragraph at one point in this whole book when he considers, and I think it's even Engels inserting himself in this, but if we only lived in a world in which workers made to supply for themselves, each individual worker to supply for themselves, we wouldn't have an excess to take care of people who can't work. So we need to have some degree of surplus value, but instead of that surplus value going to some capitalist, greedy capitalist to earn it, uh, to spend on yachts or you know to grow their own industry, instead if it was spent on healthcare, on education, on things like that, then it would be like, it would still be alienated labor insofar as you are not reaping the benefits of everything that you work toward, but it would be like a kind of humanitarian uh, alienated labor, where some of what you earn is going to help those people who can't participate, who can't be a part of working life, who can't exist as active agents in production. And also, if this would, and we'll talk about this more as we go on or much later in the book, if this were to occur, it would also come with an acknowledgement that machines and techniques that we've acquired mean that we can satisfy needs plus excess in order to benefit all the people in, in, you know, through arts and culture and healthcare and education, we would be able to supply all of this with a serious reduction in the amount of work that would actually be required. So we can't do away with work entirely. At least, I don't think we get that in Marx. We, we're always going to need work to occur, but would be able to reduce it to almost an absolute minimum if we used uh, the means of production rationally instead of irrationally, or we destroy stock just to maintain prices of things or to superficially elevate their price. But anyways, I digress. So let's return to profit rate here. So across industries where, you know, the example we just gave, some industries struggle more than others, and if they are necessary industries in order to meet a demand, they need to set the price. Now, this average price needs to be uh, needs to be kind of adhered to, or else an industry is not going to be competitive, or it's going to put other necessary industries out of business. And there's a term for this in economics. I'm not I'm not very smart with present day economic uh, terminology, but it, it's a term that refers to the necessity of competition in order to have like mutual growth uh, across different industries. And you don't want to just be putting all of your competitors out of business because that will actually hurt you at the end of the day. But anyways, um, that I'm not. if anyone knows, just drop that in the comments. But the idea is, of course, that you need to maintain this average and not stray too far from it. 
Now for this average to emerge, two things must happen. Firstly, the different individual values must be equalized to give a single social value, and this happens through competition. And uh, this must establish, it must be established a market value where there's a steady equilibrium between supply and demand. But supply and demand and its relationship to natural market price is kind of a mystery. So in political economy, in that domain of thought, among vulgar economists, where supply and demand are equal, the price of the supply, the, the price that the supply is sold at is its natural market price. But what comes first? That is, here we're confronted with another chicken and egg situation, where if supply and demand are equal, then you have uh, everything that is made is sold for an amount that everybody can pay for. So does the price affect the equilibrium between supply and demand or vice versa? So in his words, cotton prices determine the supply of cotton goods. So the idea is that in political economy, supply and demand are going to affect the price, where if there is an increase in demand, price can go up because supply comes down. So people can charge more to meet this new uh, high demand, that is if the supply has come down, and this is going to set the price. But if prices are just changed, couldn't this also affect the supply and demand, where if there's going to be a change in the prices of, of a thing, then that's going to result in a differing demand for that thing. And we see that the supply and demand of any given industry is going to be affected by the supply and demand of other industries as well. So the capitalist economy takes the equilibrium, that is when supply and demand are, are the same, or when they meet, takes this as a benchmark. So this means that it cannot, uh, cannot stop, otherwise everything would crumble. It therefore naturalizes its own properties, it naturalizes the progression at this rate. And to do this, it renders capital more and more mobile, and it renders labor more mobile. So how competition benefits capitalist class as a whole, then we now know, and he, he puts it in kind of conspiratorial language, he says that why the capitalists, no matter how little love is lost among them in their mutual competition, are nevertheless united by a real free mason masonry vis-a-vis -vis the working class as a whole. But anyway, that's kind of a funny point that I like. So to return again to this thing about supply and demand, the state of equilibrium always implies that the supply and the demand will mean like the best price for consumers and for the people selling products. But you can't make money if this is the case. If supply and demand is met across all enterprises, what this means is that everybody is just earning the average social um, production price of things which means that you aren't going to get rich. You aren't going to be able to exceed above everybody else if you're just making what everyone else does. And so inflation will catch up to you and you will just be among like everybody else. So I think this is why here he introduces this logic of <laughs> kind of this conspiratorial, anti-conspiratorial language to refer to the way that capitalists work because they, despite the fact that they claim to correspond to supply and demand or listen to the calls of supply and demand, actually look for their own interest and work amongst themselves in order to artificially elevate the prices of things in order to best suit that interest of being above the social average. And of course, there are going to be limits on this, assuming, of course, that the market is going to be able to pull back in those deviations from the norm. Uh, but as we will see, as he talks about in quite a few chapters, interest and the stock market are excellent ways for people to escape from any kind of laws of capital. And it actually presents a fundamental problem uh, for capitalism in its future. And that puts us here into chapter 11, the effects of the general fluctuations in wages on the prices of production. So he shows that the math on this, and I'm not going to go into all the math because it's so hard to, to convey that through just words. But the, the conclusion that he draws is that depending on the composition of capital, where you have high, comp high composition where more is spent on constant capital versus wages, or low composition where less is spent on constant capital than wages, a change in wages will produce different effects on price. 
So change in wages in high composition will have a different effect than change in wages in a low composition environment. So if we hypothetically had an industry that had a high composition, and we'll just use the same one we used last time, 80C plus 20V plus 20S. In this situation, if wages go up from 20 to 25, then there would be a reduction of profit price from 20% to 14-ish percent. So the total amount of value in value stays the same, 20 plus 20 or 25 plus 15. And I didn't explain this 15, so let me, let me explain this. In the first composition or the first arrangement here, we had 20 spent on wages, 20 on surplus value. Assuming there isn't a rise in surplus value, because you can't just magically make the people work harder for whatever reason, instead, the capitalist needs to compensate for that added cost in wages by reducing the amount of surplus value taken. So they want to maintain still uh, the same end product of 100. So in the first case, it was 80 plus 20 plus 20 equals, sorry, 120. And then in the second case, you have 80 plus 25. To maintain this 120, you need S to be 15. So in that case, what you find is that the profit rate of the first one, 20 related to 100, 20 surplus related to 20 spent on wages plus 80 spent on constant capital is 20%. In the second case, you have 15 in relation to uh, in relation to 100, or sorry, in relation to 110, because you had, or 105, Jesus, 105, because you had 80 spent on constant and then 25 spent on wages. So 15 related to 105 is about 14%. So what we see here is that as wages have gone up, profit rate has gone down, that this is a high composition situation, or an equilibrium situation, sorry. Uh, what we have found is that as wages go up, profit rate comes down. Ugh, sorry, I hope that was, that was clear. The, the simple point is that, of course, as you spend more on wages, you're gonna earn less in profit. That's all you have to know. Now, in a low composition environment where less is spent on constant capital versus more spent on variable capital on wages in relationship to the average, uh, in such a case, because more capital is destined to wages, a rise in wages will mean a rise in production price and the price of the things that you sell, which might, it might mean a raise in the actual profit that you can make because you're paying less in constant capital and you're paying more and therefore earning more in what you're exploiting. And then in a high composition environment where more is spent on constant capital than wages, less capital is destined to wages. And so an increase in wages will decrease the entire production price. And it will mean probably a reduction in your profit rate because you're spending way more on things that aren't earning you surplus machines and way less on the thing that's earning you uh, surplus, that is wages. So no matter what changes occur, there will be a gravitation to general rate of profit. If wages go down, the capitalists will try to keep the lesson labor doing the same work as before uh, by making them work harder. So if, you know, you have to pay less in wages, you could, you know, make your people work harder. Uh, the fewer people you have now, because wages, assuming that the fallen wages has meant that you've needed less workers, you can make them work harder in order to earn you more surplus value by extracting more from them. And that puts us here into chapter 12, supplementary remarks uh, for this whole part two. So changes in the price of production can occur for only two reasons. First one, the surplus value changes as a result of a change in value of labor, that is, it, it becomes more or less efficient in industries that produce means of subsistence for workers and not luxury goods. So this is referring to like food that everyone needs. So a change in that, that surplus value in those industries is going to have an effect on the total bearing of all labor in society, where if the price of necessary goods like corn in certain settings, if those go up, wages are gonna to need to go up in all the other industries in order to give the workers enough in order to buy the food they need to live. Same applies to the housing, same applies to other necessities, in which case in all of those other industries, those capitalists are gonna be making less money because they're spending more on wages.
And so the rate of profit will probably come down. And then there can be situations in which the surplus value stays the same, but the price alters. There's a difference in price. Now, it's important here to think of these variations as part of a total social capital. So don't think of any variation in any industry as just existing on its own. This variation has to be related to a total social capital, total average surplus value, total average profit in order to understand what the effect will be if there's an increase or a decrease in any of these elements here. So a commodity A might go up in price without a change in composition of, of the surplus value or of the industry itself because of a higher cost of commodity B. Maybe one way to think about this would also be like inflation. So if you're making sweaters from wool and the price of wool goes up, the price of the commodity of sweaters will also go up because suddenly your raw materials that you are using are worth more. Or uh, if we aren't thinking about one industry's use of raw materials being the determining factor here, if you have, um, I don't know, if the price of oil goes up, you're going to have the price of um, all other <laughs> goods go up because everybody, so many people need, at least in North America, need oil in the form of and its refinement in gas and so employers are ostensibly going to raise their wages and of course this is the big joke is that they won't do this but according to adam smith and other political economists they will they're going to raise wages so that their workers can actually get the necessities they need and live lives so that they can return to work the next day as good productive workers because you don't want your people to be suffering to be hungry, because then they won't work real well. And this is kind of the dream that capitalism offers, is that it's always going to look after its workers, when in fact, that that is not the case. It will just keep them above, just above, on average. It will keep them just above like absolute suffering, almost death, in order to keep them as good, productive agents in that society. Now, all of these changes that occur are changes that happen in exchange. And all this does, like from the last episode, is it contributes to the illusion that capitalists and political economists like to, this illusion that they like to spread, that it is in circulation that the value of things is determined. When in fact it is, of course we know, it is labor that determines these things. And sure, there might be fluctuations in price among things in circulation. But this is largely due to uh, cheating and cunning and, you know, taking advantage of other people, uh, you know, using usury, essentially, to extract more from people to sell above the prices of things. But this can only work for an individual uh, industry for like a very short period before they're caught or before they're not going to be able to be competitive anymore for any number of reasons. And it also just feeds into the idea that Marx is putting forward that capitalists are quite bad at doing capitalism. By being interested solely on your own interest or your own well-being, your own profit, your own money, you are essentially doing a disservice to the actual total social wealth that you could be a part of that capitalism could produce. Now, this isn't me saying that capitalism can be saved, uh, at least not according to how I understand Marx here, but According to Adam Smith and David Ricardo, people who had a lot of faith in capitalism, the way that capitalism actually runs has nothing to do with the way that they saw it. They were living in a fairy tale land in the way that they thought that the market would just naturally regulate itself. Because of course, people's own individual interests will drive them not to follow any kind of, uh, any kind of supply and demand, any kind of natural rate of of, of price or profit or anything like that. And yeah, so that will end us off here. Next time, episode three, we're going to start from part three, the law of the tendential fall in the rate of profit, which will go to show or will, which will demonstrate how over time in capitalist production, the profit rate that we've been talking about here, average profit rate, will actually come down, which is very important part of this whole thing. And uh, yeah, if there's anything I, I excluded, I'd love to hear about it. Anything I got wrong, I'd love to hear about it. Or if you just want to leave five stars, leave a review. Excuse me, leave a review. Uh, I love to read them all. Uh, and yeah.
Catch you next time. Take care.